we have four panelists. Very happy that you're all here. And uh, I would like to start with introduction. Uh, real quick, just everybody introduces themselves briefly or not so briefly as you like. But keep in mind, we don't have unlimited time. And I would like to start with Mel. Hello. Okay. Hi, Melanie Sumner. I am a design systems engineer at HashiCorp and a member of the Ember Framework core team and an invited expert for the WAI ARIA working group, which is the accessibility specification. Hello. There we go. Uh, I am Chris Manson, one of two Chris's on the panel. Um, I'm on the Ember core learning team and yeah, I work for Main Matter. Um, yeah, doing a lot of Ember things a lot of the time. And uh, I'm Ed Faulkner. Um, I'm on the Core Framework team and a bunch of other teams and um, get to spend a lot of time working on Ember stuff. And the remote Chris. <laughs> There's always at least two Chris's on any Ember event. It's just, it's a necessity. It's a hard requirement. Uh, I'm Chris Kreitcho. I'm one of the tech leads for the big app at LinkedIn, the one you think of as LinkedIn. And I'm also a member of the Ember framework and typed Ember core teams. So if you like TypeScript, you're welcome. If you hate TypeScript, it's my fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we have one person who, in the panel who hates TypeScript. But um, Oh, I know. Let's not get lost in that topic. <laughs> Uh, great. Yeah. Thanks uh, to our panelists. Uh, I'm Marco Ottowitter, uh, Managing Director of Main Meta, previously Simplabs, uh, as hopefully everybody knows by now. Uh, I'll be moderating. I have opinions about a lot of things as well, but I will be holding those back and, and let the panelists um, speak. So um, what I would like to start with is kind of a bit of a, a state of the Ember community thing, right? And I would like to hear a bit sort of what do you think sort of what are the challenges we are facing? What are you looking forward to? Like I said, until next Ember Fest, maybe. Uh, also, what will you be working on specifically and might want to get some help with maybe? Um, so we we give everybody kind of a bit of, of an overview where we are, where we're going and what challenges we're facing along that way and so who would like to start? I would say it's open. Ad seat Mod break. Moderators should yeah. tell us what to do, I think. Yeah. But nobody wants to be the force themselves to be first. But if you're, if you're signing me up. Yeah. I'll okay. No. <laughs> All right. I'll go first. So I think when I think about the challenges that we have in Ember, some of the same ones come up. There's always too much work. There's always too few contributors. How do we fix that problem? How do we work on that? Um, and I think we have recently, I've noticed, Vercel's really stepped up with Next and Turbo Repo and Svelte. And they're really taking on a lot trying to make, I think they're trying to make it like Ember, but you can host it with them, I think. So I think that's a challenge for us because there's a lot of really smart people working on those projects and they're trying to make them work together in a really cohesive way. Um, and so we have a game to step up, I guess. That's our challenge, right? Um, and But as I see our tools become more flexible, as I hear about how we're focusing more on, hey, JavaScript instead of like Ember, that gives me hope that this will work out and we can keep keep calm and carry on, keep doing what we do. Um, I've been working on the A11Y automation tracker and keeping up with, now we still have more accessibility automation than any of the other frameworks. So that's probably not gonna change anytime like soon, but I'm starting to see little pockets, like people trying to write linters for lit or um, Vue or React. and I think that's a that's a good thing. So um, as we participate more in the general JavaScript ecosystem, like the good things that we have will be improvements for others and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, you, uh, like like one thing I I would like to um, 
uh, as sort of you said, like like Russell is like like putting a lot of money and so on in XJS and so on, investing heavily, uh, which is something I I think we don't have as much right now, at least in in the Amo community, right? Like, I think it was a bit different like a few years ago with massive LinkedIn investments, but that has been yeah, so kind of going down, I guess. What I'm seeing is um, folks who do invest time and money into improving Ember are improving the Ember situation at their own company. And I don't necessarily see the holistic kind of, hey, what is everybody doing? Yes. And we do have, a, we have the RFC process and that works great. And anybody can weigh in. But hands up, who here? Who's who's weighed in on RFC lately? Yeah, three people. <laughs> so um, we could do better at that. If we as we get uh, okay, Chris. Other Chris counts too. Hi. <laughs> um, so as we get, we need to up. You know, we need to encourage our own selves. Hey, this is how my voice is heard. We have a process to hear voices, but we're not hearing them. And it's a lot of work to go do all the outreach to get everybody's feedback, right? So read an RFC, leave a comment. Even if you don't like it, even if you like it and you're like, this is a great RFC, I want to see this. Like, even that helps. Some kind of comment is better than silence. Yeah. Also, like I would say it's one thing... Um, also reading or writing or like commenting on a CFP um, on an IFC and then it's another thing implementing it right I think that's probably also where you need a bit more more power but um, any of the other uh, panelists uh, want to respond to that Chris? I think you've teed me up for what I wanted to say perfectly thank you man. good um, <laughs> essentially I've been working uh, with Ricardo Mendes uh, Lox as everybody knows him on this new RFC rendering app um, it's kind of basic at the moment, but it's something that essentially I agree with very much everything that you said about like we've got an RFC process, it works, but we need more engagement from the community. Part of that is ourselves, like I have a lot of things that I do, so I don't have a lot of time to engage in that way. But part of it is also how hard it is to do it and how hard it is to know which RFCs to talk about at what time and which things are done. like. If you've got an accepted RFC, how do you know which one needs help today to move it from almost like I just thought about to almost done or shipped or recommended? Um, and that's kind of what I propose to the Ember core learning team in our like yearly meeting in 2019, which feels like a thousand years ago now. Um, and I've been slowly thinking about it and making it happen. And essentially, I want everybody to be able to go to rfcs.emberjs.com and know what the next steps are. Like, see what things are in a final comment period. See what things are currently active. See what, see what percentage something is to being done. And then being encouraged by that to go, oh, do you know what? I could help push that over the hill and get it done and get that in front of people. Um, and I actually picked up one of these RFCs uh, on my like weekly stream that was written and merged in 2016 for Ember Data Meta something for like objects. The, the details aren't all that relevant, but the fact that it was there and nobody picked it up and it was a like contributors wanted it was an easy thing for somebody to pick up but it was so hard to find and that's what i'm trying to help the community with a little bit uh i i could riff on what you were just talking about with rfc's because there's actually been a whole bunch of really useful movement there which if you've looked at the rfc staging uh proposal it's kind of a meta rfc about trying to make rfc's easier to understand their status as they move through different stages uh, a bunch of folks have done a lot of work on that. Um, Katie Gangler, especially, has been doing a whole bunch of uh, release automation stuff around it so that you can much more automatically um, see the state of things and understand like the difference between an RFC that is just somebody submitted it and they think it's good, but nobody else has really even put any weight behind it all the way up through this is actually done. You should expect to be able to use that in a current release um, and, and all the levels in between. So. Definitely some nice uh, work going on in the community there. Uh, I, I could respond also to questions about like uh, 
you know, levels of investment into the framework. I, I kind of, I don't ever want to see uh, us become the, the kind of um, open source Inc model, right? Where one company, particularly a VC backed company is the only one paying all the all, people to work directly on a framework. I, I like the model that we actually have quite a lot of, which is people at legitimate companies, profitable companies and startups uh, who get time out of their time as part of their job to invest into this community. That's a very durable model. It has its trade-offs, right? It means that, um, you know, it's, if it's not your full-time job, you're not going to make big bang stuff happening in very short periods of time, but it's also much more durable over the long run. Um, you know, uh, startups run out of money or pivot and then their project goes away. And it's, there's really no company that could kill this project. Um, you know, it's just way too heavily invested in and depended on by too many uh, very big and profitable businesses that can pay their people to work on it and do. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting to estimate how many millions of dollars worth of developer hours companies do pour into it every year still, and it's a lot. Uh, so it might not feel the same as a flashy startup who went out and raised $10 million and hired a team to ship a new framework, but I like our model uh, just the way it is. Yeah. Um, Chris, uh, um, uh, Chris Krakow, um, uh, talking about the, 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 uh, uh, the state of things in, in Ember and so on, you're obviously working on TypeScript, right? Which is like a big thing in Ember at the moment, or is like going to be a, a big thing. Um, can you talk about that a bit, maybe about sort of yeah. status? Yeah, I think and what I would say on TypeScript specifically is we are... And I think this actually is a theme for a lot of the things we're doing right now. We are in the phase of playing catch up. Um, the stuff we're, we're shipping right now is by and large stuff that most of our competitors uh, in the framework landscape have to various degrees. But we're trying to play catch up in a way that puts us ahead. Um, so as an example, right now, Vue ships types out of the box for Vue 3. Um, Svelte does for Svelte, Svelte kit. Um, React doesn't. Those live on definitely typed like our types have historically, and they're actually maintained by Microsoft, which helps them a lot. Uh, I would like my types to be maintained by Microsoft. Um, but what we're tracking toward is a world where we own the TypeScript story end to end. We have a solid story around semantic versioning for it, uh, which at this point, nobody else has tried to solve. Um, we're trying to, we'll see how well it works. Uh, so far, the data is not in, so we don't know. We're also working on, we have a very similar challenge to Vue and Svelte in terms of mapping our template layer into something that TypeScript understands. And we're trying to get to a point where we're comparable to them, but all of us right now have a challenge that we have to literally parse our templates into something that TypeScript understands before we can hand it to TypeScript, which means that the experience for us with Glint and for Vue and Svelte with uh, their processes, they're all a little slow and they you feel it pretty quickly because you just have to do a lot more work. So one of the things we have on our medium term roadmap that we've been thinking a lot about is how do we make that super fast so that you don't feel it, you don't pay for it. And that would be a thing that puts us at least comparable to the React TSX experience um, with some of the up upsides and benefits of the template import stuff that we've been working on and things like that. Big picture, the goal is have minimum parity with our peers out there and at best do better than our peers out there, but also look for ways we can generalize that. Like one of the things that came out of the template imports work that I helped drive because it's key for TypeScript is stuff that Yehuda is working on and collaborating with other folks in other ecosystems around, hey, can we generalize this template tag idea? Can we make it a general purpose tool so that you can write quote unquote CSS in JS, but where you're actually writing CSS in a style tag comparable to the template tag, et cetera. So that we can take that nice spot in the trade-off space that we've found and generalize it and make it better. Like, could we share tooling with Vue and Svelte? There's a world where that's imaginable and where we could get to a point where all of us who value that HTML first semantics, but also want TypeScript 
can all be winning together. That's kind of the direction and trajectory I see us on for all of these pieces. Yeah. So what's the experience that someone would get using TypeScript in Ember now, in particular with Glint, I think. I think the JavaScript uh, script side is, or the, the actual code side is kind of easier, but like I said, the templating is harder. Yeah. With Glint, you get autocomplete, you get go to definition, you get refactoring, you get all the pieces, as long as you have a well-formed template. So if you type, oh, you know, the opening of an HTML tag, and then you type at to pass an, you know, not an HTML tag, but a component, uh, angle bracket, some component name, and then you type at, and you want completions for that, it's going to bail because our parser today says, I don't know what that is. Our parser was designed to compile templates for the build pipeline. And so when it sees an error, it just says, no, stop. We can't ship this to prod. What are you talking about? So we need to fix that. We need an error recovery parser. We also need it to be a lot faster. So as long as you have a closing tag after it, you'll get auto completion, go to definition otherwise. And otherwise your editor is going to explode into red squiggles because it's like, what, what are you even talking about? This isn't a valid template. So it's things like that, that we want to solve, but it is a massively better experience. There was a, a user in the topic TypeScript room on Discord who was noting this week that the difference between having Glint and not is the difference between, okay, TypeScript's, you know, it's good, it's helpful, and oh, this is awesome. Uh, it it makes, and, and the key here is it'll work for your JavaScript. You write some JS doc comments and it'll work for you too. And like, I, I always reiterate when we're talking TypeScript that the point of the way we approach this here is that all the work we do on this benefits everybody. So you write JS doc comments to describe, here's what the shape of my API is, which then get turned into your docs in whatever docs publishing pipeline you have. Well, Glint can understand those. And so you can get all of these benefits, whether you're a JS user or not. Okay. But I guess there's lots of work to do there. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I could vouch as somebody who didn't help write Glint that it's already pretty awesome to use. And it's, for me, it's already worth the trade-off on an app where I get to pick. Um, the downsides that remain are mostly, you know, there are, there are some words to most to fix. Uh, we have to get enough people using the new syntax before we can convince GitHub to syntax highlighted it on github.com, for example. So that's like little warts, um, but those to me are still already worth the trade-off. It's like already more productive for me to use it when I could. Uh, so, you know, it's, yeah, there's work to do, but it's already a net positive, I think. Yeah. 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 So, um, like, uh, TypeScript is like, um, I think one of the big topics in Ember currently, the other one we heard from you about in the morning ad is, uh, routing, right? We all know that it will change. We heard like how it roughly will change, how it's going to look. Uh, so I guess that's also what you will be working on in the future or? Yeah, I think probably yes. I've always kind of said uh, in recent times that I saw uh, the build reform work around Embroider as kind of priority number one. So I spent a lot of time on that. Um, that's still kind of my priority number one is seeing that through making sure until it's really the default for everybody and we're really squeezing all the benefits out of those capabilities. Um, routing's been my number two though, behind that all along. It, not because, um, you know, I think it's not because it's some disaster, but because it's just an area that has waited longer than other areas. So many other areas we've already got a chance to iterate and move ahead from what our APIs were like five or seven or 10 years ago. Uh, and in the router, uh, it's just been, that one has been, a, got less love, right? Somebody's got to spend the time to come around. And give it a, give it a fresh re, fresh look now that we can now that we have so many other nice things and now I'm, I'm going to start repeating the talk if I go into that more but that's the gist of it so yes I mean yes I expect to be involved um, part of my motivation framing the topic the way I did today is I really do want to try to um, spread the general knowledge about the direction we're trying to go so that more people can be involved it doesn't have to be the same set of contributors all the time um, I'd say both on the like. The example that Chris just gave about a error recovery parser for handlebars, um, that's a great example of, you know, if you're looking for a chance to contribute to open source in a, in, in a, a very, that's a very well-scoped project, right? It's not an easy project, but if you're looking to level up and when's the last, you know, if hmm. a lot of times if you spend all day working on front end applications, maybe you haven't had a chance to write a parser ever or in a long time. It's a pretty fun kind of open source to do, uh, and it, that one's a pretty well-scoped problem, right? So 
somebody's ambitious and wants to take that on, that's a pretty cool way to start getting uh, involved and contributing. And I'd say the same thing about prototyping all the new things we want in routing because of what I said, because you can build it on primitives that you know and give it a go. And it was great to hear feedback from a bunch of folks in the audience after my talk who said, you know, some of those things you pointed out as future possible patterns, those are things we've tried in our app. Like we did a thing just like that. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, so I know we have a lot of knowledge out there already among experienced developers in the community on how a lot of these patterns could work. And so we can draw on that, get more people to put together examples and say, this is how I think the next version should work. And once you have all those working examples, it's so much easier to sit down, write an RFC that points at them and says, see, this works. Let's just make that the standard thing uh, and get move rapidly move forward to consensus on it and, and then just ship it standard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are your uh, sort of focus areas going to be for the next year, uh, Madam Chris? Probably project planning Polaris. Mm -hmm. um, now, I could actually put out a call to action on this. I think Ember could really use a full time project manager or GPM because I sort of do it in my in between times and, you know, you do the best you can. And I've been doing this a really long time. So there's, like ways and means to get a little bit more out. I know some shortcuts kind of thing, sure. but I would really love to see um, maybe a few companies could sponsor Ember. So Ember could hire a like proper GPM to kind of give us those roadmaps and kind of work out how that all fits together. Um, but for the immediate future, that's what I plan to be working on. And then I have, a bunch more ideas for how we can make Ember more accessible and easier for developers to get right. And that's yep. really what I want to focus on. I want to focus on the tools that help everyone in this room do it without even knowing it or know how easily know how to do it and easily know what you need to do and give you those smart guardrails along the way so you don't fail. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Also, I guess uh, sort of the uh, uh, the topic of making sure Ember is sponsored and can actually hire a project manager. So it's a kind of a call to action for everybody in the audience, I guess. So talk to their like decision makers, uh, uh, whatever, to maybe I don't know, come together, fund the project, and then and then uh, 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 sort of you invest in making sure that what you build on is like uh, moving forward and and well maintained and everything, right? Which is uh, pretty important, actually. Uh, Chris, what's your focus going to be? Uh, so, what do they say? If you have too many focuses, you're not focused. Um, yes. Yeah, I I have the over focused. Yeah, I'm, I have the unfortunate problem of being over focused. I have <laughs> a lot of things in the fire at the moment. As you see, I invent things all the time. Um, but I I believe it or not, I'm in a kind of consolidation uh, like phase at the moment. A lot of my experiments have kind of gone through one first phase and I'm trying to make them ergonomic in such a way. So like what you saw a bit of field guide today in my talk, um, one of the things I've been working behind the scenes with Ed about is I want field guide to work by default for all add-ons and to like be green on CI everywhere. But right now that doesn't work for uh, embroider, for embroider optimized because I'm essentially doing pretty strange things in, in field guide. And one of the things I do is I compile markdown in the browser for the actual documentation. So when you're writing markdown that has, uh, Ember components in it, it works properly, but because embroider then changes everything about where things are expected to like, where does that component come from? It's not all baked in from day one. So I've been trying to finesse a uh, field guide into a way that it, it plays nicely with all these tools. And, uh, I have to say, thanks Ed for like, giving so much of your time. Um, I don't know if this is very well known, but Ed has, uh, embroider office hours on a Thursday, what, what it's seven o'clock, uh, Irish time. I don't know what that is in international times. Um. But yeah, eight o'clock European. Um, but it's, I've, I've regularly kind of showed up and like stolen two hours of your morning slash afternoon. Um, and that's been really good. So 
essentially I'm trying to, I have all these projects that I'm working on, but I'm trying to get them to a state where everybody in the Ember community can start making use of them. And it's not just, oh, I want this project to be more useful than the other. I don't, I mean, it's not a competition thing. It's like, uh, I want, I want Ember developers to be able to focus on what they want to do. I want them to work on components, not fight with Ember CLI add-on docs for 20 hours to make it do the thing and then figure out there's a bug somewhere. Um, so I'm trying to make it simpler by taking a lot of the complication and baking it into this very small tool that people depend on, and then they can get back to their day jobs or weekend warrior of like building something cool. But yeah, that's kind of my focus in a nutshell. Yeah. I think supporting like add-on developers is a particularly important thing also regarding Embroider, right? Because a lot of work needs to happen in the community sort of to make sure that add-ons work with Embroider so you can then like update the add-on in the app and then eventually update your, your app, right? So I yeah, think that's, yeah, for sure. uh, that's I mean, it's been quite a, work. a while now that we've had uh, testing for Embroider in the stock blueprint for add-ons. So if add-on officers have yeah. run their, their Ember CLI update, um, it's been quite a while now that they've had the tests. That doesn't mean everybody had the time to make the test pass, but it's been there in the defaults for quite a while, and that's helping. We get a, a lot of stuff does work now, uh, and increasing. There's a there's a document on the Inverted repo about um, at the add-on author guide. It talks about the different levels of support you can have. Uh, people can check that out if, out if they're curious. But a lot of stuff is moving. It's either fully compat. It's either compatible or it's actually fully in the native v2 add-on format now, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. I think would be interesting because here at the conference, we probably have a lot of people that maintain add-ons, right? So could we maybe have a quick show of hands, like who, who maintains their own add-on? <laughs> and who has made sure that it works properly with Embroider? In particular with like pretty Embroider good. strict pretty mode good. or like... Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. That's not a bad. Uh... Great, cool. Um, also, one thing that I forgot to say in the beginning, uh, we do accept questions also in between the, the, uh, the or um, during the panel. Uh, we will have some dedicated time in the end, but if you feel like you want to like add something or ask something about like a particular thing that we talk about, uh, then just wave your hand and, and uh, there's no or, or uh, type in the Zoom chat. And apparently somebody has done that. Oh, you have a question yourself, I'm good, yeah. For any world view, what is one of the most like support joy this year? Like so many outside contributing to something because I think it's but here I don't think yeah. Okay, so the question was what has sparked joy for you in the past recent history from a contributor contributing to a project? Um I would say you implemented dark mode in my A11Y tracker website, and that was pretty cool because then I didn't have to do it. Um, that was a lot of sparking of joy. And I've gotten so much good feedback from even outside the Ember community, from the accessibility or web com community in general. And everyone was really delighted to see dark mode come to that app. So thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of adjust the question a little bit. It wasn't from an outside contributor, but um, I think it was uh, Steve uh, came up to me today uh, and kind of talked to me about how they're using Lint to the future in Conto. And it's like, oh, this is awesome. And just the fact that, uh, there he is. <laughs> um, and the fact that I built a little tool that was inspired by Pat O'Callaghan, who's on the, he's listening in, I think. I think I saw his name on the list. Um, and like, I took this idea, turned it into a tool other people could use and then being so like emphatic about this is awesome. I like using it. Like that is what gives me the joy to keep going and to build another thing and, you know, to make it, to keep them working essentially so that everybody can use these tools. I, I was actually trying to pull up GitHub because my memory is really bad and I don't want to call out people's <laughs> amazing contributions and miss some people. Uh, I didn't get far enough there, but there's best, been a whole bunch of really excellent contributions from folks in the community. Um, you know, when you say outside contributor, um, it's, I mean, yes, that can kind of just mean somebody who does not on the core teams. Uh, but you know, I think that's still not really outside. I think the folks who, some folks really just they've been around a while, they've learned enough, and now they're able to contribute back. And it's amazing. It's awesome. It's, it's just community contribution, right? I mean, so, um, 
bunch of really good stuff. Uh, a person at the conference here, I'd like to give a shout out to Simon over here, Simon Imig. His PRs are always great. Uh, always happy when we get him. Uh, he and Preston uh, Nullbox Pactolite just did an amazing job pulling together the V2 add on blueprint where I had just kind of like thrown together very loose notes and they really spearheaded turning into a real project. I didn't have to do anything. Uh, that kind of stuff is great. And so, like, but I also hesitate to say uh, outside contributors because I want to draw, suck all those people into being inside contributors. Like, you're now, you're, you're now co maintainers. Like, keep, keep it up. Um, and lots of other great stuff too. I, that's why I wanted to try to pull up a list. I'm going to forget people's names, but like, um, there's definitely a lot of folks who um, always really, really happy. Also, just another thing that has made me happy is, you know, I, I've definitely spent quite a bit of time helping people with apps, getting them working under embroider, testing embroider under them. And so um, when you do that, of course, you run into things like an atom that's not working. And um, so many times I've been delighted to see a problem, start to de diagnose it, go look of stream and realize they fixed it already. Somebody took care of it. Right? I didn't have to fix it. Uh, I just had to upgrade. Uh, seeing lots of that out there. And that goes also for things like um, Timber 4 compatibility, uh, things like upgrades like that. Um, you know, I do think there's some really active folks in the community who are just going around and uh, updating stuff and shepherding projects, right? That's it's really... Um, it's a general pattern in the, in the whole world and not just in software, not just in our community that like remembering to focus on maintaining the infrastructure you've got is hard because it's not as glorious as building new things. Uh, but it's just like, it's what keeps the world going around and uh, love to see it. We really do have, you know, yes, you can always use more of that, but the stuff the what we do have is really, really good and uh, always delights me. Um, anything in particular that, that sparked up for you? Chris? Yeah, there were there were a few. One of them, uh, Ed just mentioned Simon Emig. He showed up and basically did the work to figure out how Glint should work for add-ons that want to publish Glint types. That was huge. It was a thing that was on our backlog of like, we need to figure this out. And we hadn't gotten there and just boom, how's this? And we had to do like this much tweaking and it was, it was done. Um, another one was a colleague of mine picked up the work to kind of figure out, okay, how do we actually get TypeScript support in our docs, which is a big, hard problem, and started putting together a quest for it. And this week, all of the things that, like some of the mechanical work that needed to get done, got done. And a bunch of those were people who created open source GitHub accounts to go do that work because it was an easy in to start working. And just seeing people who like made GitHub accounts a week ago to go get it done is a really amazing thing to see. It's just like, hey, cool. Now these are people who feel like, I can do this and they they can now keep contributing and lean in and they're asking hey what can we do next because they felt good about it yeah that's great oh, that's I, so I thought one more person i have to Sorry. shout out because they're the other hugely prolific contributor sergey astapov has probably converted more add-ons to v2 than anybody doing excellent work in the community thank you sergey i don't know if you're here i don't think i saw you at the conference but wherever you are thank you yeah so sergey and simon if you if you're here or you'll see it later then um, lots of love for you here on the panel. <laughs> uh, I would like to switch topics a bit now. Um, we, we mentioned like how, how companies like Wurzel and also I guess Netlify and so on invest a lot in other frameworks and there's like new frameworks around like Remix, everybody's heard about, um, like probably are good options for many things and probably all, all good tech, uh, uh, or, or all cool tech, sorry. Um, I, I think all that raises the question though, how do we, how do we position Ember in comparison, right? Like what's the sweet spot for Ember as a framework and what use cases does make sense and what use cases does it not make sense and sort of positioning it against an alternative solution might maybe not help because sort of we would clearly lose anyway, while in another use case, we're like far ahead maybe. Um, and I, I think that also relates to the point then how, how would anyone pitch Ember to their CTO, right? Like anyone plans a new project, why would they choose Ember? Or what would the project have to look like so that Ember would be a good choice? And, uh, I'm sure there's lots of opinions on the panel regarding that. Absolutely. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of work lately around uh, what kind of metrics would a CTO need to see? Because I, 
in my work in accessibility, especially, I've been thinking about, well, what's the gap between accessibility and designers, accessibility and developers? And then, because I hear a lot of stories from y'all, you know, I can want to care, but they tell me I work, I just have to do the work. I just have to do other work. I just have to ship it. We don't have time. Okay. So thinking about what do product owners, product managers, CTOs, what do they care about? And doing the work to try to draw the lines between what are the value adds of Ember and what are they looking for? What is important to them? And showing them, just doing the hard work of just showing them, trying to speak a different language, it kind of feels like. Um, because there's a lot of things that I wouldn't think are important. But then I talk to product owners or CTOs and they tell me the important to them and it kind of blows my mind a little bit. Like, wow, really? Huh. Okay. But in doing that exercise, we've been really able to find, you know, what Ember's really good at is when you have a really interesting product and you need your technology to not get in your way. And that I, I think that's the pitch for Ember because in looking at the survey responses, even the talk today, I mean, a timeline in a museum and that's an Ember app. I'm like, oh my God, that's so cool. And then I also get comments, um, Ember's big in the agriculture industry, particularly dairy farming, because you can have one developer do your whole app, right? So Ember's ability to give you what you need and stay out of your way while you build what's important to you, that's the value add, in my opinion. That's the what's really valuable and that's what we need to convey more of in every one of these very cool ember apps that we've seen that we've heard about that we've talked about ember gets out of your way so you can build the very cool thing mr c miss mr cto do you have a very cool idea and you need the tech to support you and not get in your way yeah that's a good point i like i guess you need to have that like strong message, but you probably also need some some materials or so maybe to support people actually like yes. conveying the message. Whether we actually need to them. say it out loud. Um, I'd love to get some marketers in. Mm -hmm. I'd love to get some graphic art in and have some materials created that could evolve over time. But yeah. we really need the strong messaging because we feel it. We're here because we're fans or we're involved or we do this for a living. Um, maybe some of you are here are hostages. Sorry about that. But like, we'll win you over. Um, but I don't know. I think speak, speak it, say it, talk to somebody about it. Um, the people who are really excited about what they do. Hey, like me, I'm really excited about things and I talk about them a lot. So tell somebody, write a blog post write a tweet, uh, see, think about whether or not you know someone who's good with words and can put something together. Try to put something together yourself. Those kinds of things. And I think putting this idea in our heads and having us all think about it, I think that's where more work will come from. Um, I had, oh, and here's another thing. Just ask. I have a, a, a little quick story. Um, I was working on some drawing parallels between design heuristics and accessibility success, success criteria. And I thought, oh, it'd be really nice to have some nice artwork to go with these. So I just asked. And my creative team at work at HashCorp, thank you. They were able to make me some, they said yes. And they made me some really lovely graphics. And now I have that. So, so just ask, like, the, what's the worst that could happen? They'd say no. That might feel bad, but j just ask. Yeah. And yeah, that's a good point. Like, I think it's really easy to underestimate the impact that sort of like fancy marketing materials can actually have on, on this like success of anything, I guess, right? Yeah. Ed. Uh, I, I would like to add, I, I, I agree with all of that, but I'd like to add it, like spin off it on a slightly different angle, which is that, you know, um, 
it's easy to imagine that technologies get used or technologies get chosen by some kind of platonic ideal where people weigh down lists of pros and cons and then pick technologies. The reality is everything that we use and everything that we build and everything we depend on is very historical path dependent, right? It depends on accidents of history of when something got started, who knows who, who learned an awful lot at what job and what communities you know. And um, that's, that's how all these decisions really, that, that's a huge influence on the growth of any technology. And that's not a bad thing. It's, um, you know, I'd like to see that we've got such a strong, um, the durable thing about our community is this, is this community that has shared engineering values and a high standard of quality. And a, I think a really good uh, record of bringing new people in, teaching them, showing them the value of it, getting them engaged about it. And people go on to, they go on to start new products. They go on to um, start new companies. They grow from junior developers to senior developers. And sometimes they grow to start their own companies. Um, that is a very legitimate method of growing and sustaining a community, right? The, the organic growth that comes out of just the good work we do. Um, you can see it, the, the proof of it in both like the technical and interpersonal level. You can see the, the kind of social proof of it in the business level when you add up the, you know, the dollar value of companies built on Ember uh, selling themselves or continuing to be profitable, just being really high. So there's a huge amount of social proof and social network effects to any, any durable technology that's been around this long. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think all of that word of mouth and our, and our strong network among the community is another great way that we grow, right? I, I think there's probably people in this room who are going to start uh, successful new products that don't exist yet. And if they've been part of this community and get and buy into the values of it, they're probably going to do it with Ember. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say both very good point, right? Like it's a lot about the messaging and marketing. It's like, like, like eventually frameworks get chosen for like more social reasons, maybe than technical reasons, but yet still, I would like to go back to sort of the use case question, right? Like are there. Are there like use cases where we would rather leave those to something else because maybe that's just the better fit, but we can focus on, on other use cases then, right? And in particular, sort of like uh, coming back to something like Nexus or also Remixes, so they all like, like they have a very solid like server-side rendering story and, and so on. It's kind of like they seem to be built more for like the classic e-commerce use case, right? Where it's more like a page with a bit of, interactivity versus like a full-fledged app, right? But maybe that's where Ember uh, sort of is is stronger. So um, I I know Chris Manson has opinions about that. So Yeah, so like the fact that you say uh, next year is like there's a lot of, there's a lot of innovation happening at the moment where, you know, we had this React coming out as a library that people could use and build their own frameworks with it. And then there's these meta frameworks, which is a whole classification of, hey, it's a React thing, but we're going to make all these decisions for you. And things like Next.js, and I, I think they're one of the ones by, that Versal are kind of focusing on, yeah. they are designed to be able to do server-side oh, rendering on like on the edge, essentially. So making it so that you get really good developer experience of the thing that you're building, but also really good end user experience as well. And it's, it's interesting for me because like these are all new and fancy and everybody's talking about them on podcasts and blog posts. And it's like, we've had this stuff in Ember for so long. Like Fastboot predates all of this stuff. Now, you can't use Fastboot right now in the way that Next.js does like uh, edge routing because of a small architectural decision. But it's only like a few steps from where we are now so that the thing that actually does the rendering could be distributed on like a Lambda, whatever, and it not be too big to start up, render, and then shut down in the time that you have for that. Like we have all of these all of these amazing technologies, all these amazing things that we're doing in Ember that we're not sharing about enough. We're not telling the community that, oh, you could try this, you know, and we're not going on podcasts and saying, we've invented the best thing ever. This is wonderful. Like everybody else is doing. 
But we need to do the same thing. We need to talk about the things that we're doing. And as the, as the wider JavaScript community moves into things like Vercel, like uh, Next.js, we need to go like we did back in the early days with React going, oh, this is a component for first. We were like, oh, okay, components, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And we made components like in a very short amount of time. Um, and we can do that with a lot of the technologies that we already have, move them to be more in line with the direction of the community. I mean, to, to directly take, go back to Marco's question, though, I think there's, that's not wrong. I'm glad to see the, the wider fads in JavaScript of a lot of people who really probably should have never built front-end apps deciding they shouldn't have built front-end apps and that the, the server is fine for them. Because there's definitely yeah. apps where that's great. And um, if, I, if those were the apps I needed to build, though, I would have just still been doing Rails. I know for a fact that a lot of the apps that have motivated me are ones that really do want to be true browser apps. That is the sweet, that is definitely a sweet spot for Ember and continues to be, um, I guess I'm totally on board with the fact that we've got server side rendering support, but I think that, um, frameworks that are really trying recentering the server and trying and like treating it as this great epiphany, um, <laughs> that's for a different kind of app than the ones I'm interested in building. And so, yes, I think you're right. I think it's, that is for, um, you know, I don't think that's the right way to build a, um, that massive calendar that Forrest showed us with hundreds and hundreds of appointments on it, that's all interactive. I don't think you should server render that. I think you should have an actual application the same way we've always built client server applications, yeah. just using the web tech. Yeah. yeah. And I think that really is, that is our most sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question in the audience. Great. Hey, <clears throat> oh, wow. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'm a, I'm an engineering manager at CrowdStrike. Um, I have a team of seven right now. Um, I came from React, um, and the team I've hired has come from other places than Ember. Um, one thing I, and I actually have a two-part question. Um, and another thing, I've also become the co-organizer of Ember London after I just sort of blithely was like, yeah, I want to organize a meetup. And so I, I took it over and you'll see how this relate. Um, I think one thing I struggle with with Ember, with my team, is is what should I have them focus on? Um, they don't really know Ember. Um, you know, uh, Preston tells us to join the Discord. Um, sometimes we read the docs, but like, uh, well, you know, what's a what you, you said earlier that you kind of need help in some ways or in a lot of ways. Like, what should I tell my team to focus on when it comes to Ember? And I guess as a corollary, I have a meetup planned in October. What should a meetup focus on? We're not a company. We're a meetup in London. What could we do to help Ember? And so, yeah, that's my question. Who wants to take it? I, yeah, can, baby I can run with that one a little. Um, I think one of the things that I've found is a very helpful on just jumping in point in general is look at learning areas. Um, look at documentation, look at documentation infrastructure. Documentation infrastructure in particular is an interesting one because it doesn't require, generally speaking, deep framework knowledge. It requires like this much framework knowledge and then like, can you learn some node infrastructure or things like that? Can you wire together pieces? So those are often easier entry points to contribution to any community. The first contribution I ever did to Rust was documentation work. Um, that I think is true for a lot of people. So that's a good entry point. There's always the help wanted or um, good first issue tags on things. And then I also think just trying to deeply learn and internalize uh, how things actually work is a really big part of it. One of the things I see engineers bounce off of a lot as we help dozens of new engineers every year onboard into using and working effectively with Ember is like, okay, what's the right mental model for this? How do I think about auto tracking? How do I think about pull based reactivity systems? How do I think about real data down actions up and data ownership and things like that? Getting a deep mental model of those things uh, is really powerful. And I think helps people then see, oh, here are the gaps between where we are and, you know, where we want to be from, you know, pretty good in a bunch of areas to what would be great. And I think one of the things that made React really compelling to people is that the mental model feels small. I think one of the challenges they're having right now is that parts of the mental model don't feel as small um, in, in the same ways to a lot of folks working there. Um, 
auto tracking with components and services, it's really small and it's very composable and you can build a lot out of that. And looking at the things we're doing with routing and the things we're doing with component authoring and all these things, they're all basically pointed at that model, which I'm stealing that framing from Zurak, a former core team member who I think in Amber 2019's call for blog posts or maybe 2018 framed us as component service architecture. And I think that's that's broadly right still. Getting your head around that mental model then allows you to contribute effectively. And you can just steadily get lower and lower down the stack if and as you care to in terms of contributing. I'd also say, look around the community. It's often very tempting to think, and I see this in most major big open source projects, that the place to contribute is the thing. It's Ember or it's Rust or whatever. But a lot of times, the big gaps are doing the things, you know, Ed mentioned earlier, Sergei Astapov going around and just embroidering every dang add-on in the entire ecosystem over the course of this year. Like the lift that he made for all of us by just doing a bunch of grunt work. It's not interesting. It's not exciting. It's grunt work. But he totally flipped the ecosystem around onto being mostly on embroider by just going and doing the grunt work over and over and over and over again. That kind of thing where you look across the ecosystem. Here's an example, TypeScript support. We need a lot of apps, hopefully all the or uh, add-ons I should say, to ship types, whether it's by converting to TypeScript or whether it's by ha having hand-authored ambient types. If you're a person who likes TypeScript, going and contributing that to a community project and saying, hey, I'll help you get this built and then I'll help you maintain it over time so that if like some people that I won't name, you don't like TypeScript and you don't want to rewrite your add-on in TypeScript, but you might want people to benefit from the things that TypeScript gives you. Um, you know, I bet Chris Manson, I named the name, oh no, would welcome somebody coming along and saying, hey, here's an ambient type definition and in CI infrastructure and support for it. Even though I don't wanna write this thing in TypeScript, no thank you. Um, so things like that, where there are community efforts, community add-on ecosystem work to be done are a big one. And they're often easy to miss, but they're also some of the highest impact. Uh, Chris, please keep the TypeScript run short. Yeah, no, it's just, a, it's just a very small thing. I want to correct one record. I do have one of the add-ons that I maintain that has ambient types actually shipped to NPM. So it exists. <laughs> I'm not converting it to TypeScript. But it exists. It's awesome. I would also give some another some more advice to an engineering manager. Um, one of the best ways to help your team contribute and also just help them grow as engineers and be more effective, not just in open source, but in your product too, is to make sure that they feel they have permission to spend time debugging things that are a little beyond their comfort level. Right? And that is a cost. And if we think back to the talk about, you know, where waste occurs in process, um, looked at one way, it's waste if you spent an hour trying to debug something and didn't go immediately ask for help. Uh, however, it, that isn't waste if it turns into a, a capital investment in your own skills and in the skills of your team. And the biggest way I see people leveling up is being willing to debug down another layer to the things they're depending on, the code they didn't write. Um, you know, when something breaks, f let your team feel that they have permission to spend some time debugging down inside the add-on. Why did the add-on break? Down inside of Ember itself, why did it break? Why did the build break? Um, all that skill is incredibly valuable. Uh, junior people who don't have as much experience do need more time to do it, and so it to take some patience. It's best, it is best to get them help sooner rather than later, but that help should be in the form of pairing on the problem, not just like handing it off. Um, that is like how you build senior developers and how you get them contributing. Um, you know, once you get in that habit, finding open source things to contribute to is like, you, you can't step out your door without tripping over one because you, you try to upgrade anything or do anything and the world is full of bugs, like everything is. <laughs> you could pick any project in this under the sun. If you try to use it in a slightly interesting way or you try to upgrade it, you will find problems. And if you, instead of shrugging and moving on or trying to just like randomly poke at it till the problem goes away, you actually debug it, you, you gain the skill to do that much more quickly next time and you become somebody who can contribute. So just making sure your team has the, feels the 
the safety to do that, that they're not going to get hammered for spending that hour trying to understand a bug rather than just like knocking out the next Jira ticket. Uh, Mary, you wanted to add something as well? Well, I was, but Ed said it so well, I think I'm just going to let it rest okay. there. <laughs> Um, great. Um, I think we could have time for one more question, maybe, but I guess not more because then we're out of time. Okay, one more. Anything on Zoom or in the audience? If we don't have a question, that's fine as well because we have one last thing uh, planned anyway. And as I said, sort of, we want to talk about the state of things in Ember and also the future of Ember, but only until next Ember Fest, right? So we want to end with like a little, a little game, uh, 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 sort of, which is everybody makes a prediction until next Ember Fest. And I have like four questions prepared, and then every panelist will make a prediction. And the next year, we look at whether that came, like, uh, that became true or not. And if not, then I don't know, like, uh, nothing happens, of course, right? But if you're right, you're right. That's always nice. So, and I would just go one by one, starting with Mel. And the question for you is the question that I think we all have, which is, will Polaris have shipped until next summer fest? In order for Polaris to ship by next summer fest, there are things that need doing. So if we all decide to step up and participate and do those things, then yes. Otherwise, no. <laughs> Great answer. So yeah. if you are interested in helping with Polaris, if you want to look at how you can get involved, um, there, if you want to help project plan, if you want to help convince other people and go do a little like recruiting, uh, if you want to write some code, if you want to write documentation, if you want to help finally ship the updates to the guides and API docs, like there's a lot of stuff to do and there's a lot of ways to participate. So um, that is how we could do it. So if we do that, then yes. Yeah. Else, no. Great. So essentially it's in your hands, right? Open source. Everybody can help. Uh, next question is for Chris. It's one that we get asked a lot, but now Chris will actually make a prediction. In which country will Emberfest be next year? Yeah, this conversation has come up a lot. Um, I Obviously, everybody always thinks, oh, will it be in my country? Will it be in Ireland? But I think everybody having to fly to Ireland is a little bit much. Um, you'll do it. That's okay. Um, um I know it's already been in Spain, but I'd love for it to go back to Spain. Uh, I always love Spanish Spain. food. It's just, oh, yeah, amazing. But Spain would be my guess. Okay, so Spain is the prediction. We'll see next year where we, where we will look back at that. Um, it, seems, it seems a little unfair when they get to pick and decide if you win or lose. Uh, next uh, prediction is for Ed. Um, next MFest, will we have routable components which... I think it's kind of a fair way to describe it's a, what yeah, you're it's a, it's a fair to describe. Yeah, it's a fair description. I mean, I guess I would differ and say this is the same as Melanie's question because I think like making those, making them stock would be Polaris is shipped, right? And it's moved on to being recommended. It's fully documented. It's fully polished. So yeah, maybe if we got really good contributions. If not, it might be a little longer than that. Um, however, I think having a popular add-on in the ecosystem that is the next generation proposed routing and component system uh, is extremely plausible because I think there's a bunch of people in this room who, if they're motivated, could ship that add-on like very soon. Um, so I, my highest probability prediction is there's a popular add-on that's already using these patterns uh, and that it's on track to become the default thing in Ember by next mm -hmm. Neverfest. Yeah, that would be a nice first step for sure. Yeah. Uh, last prediction is for Chris Krakow. Um and it is, will the Tomster still have glasses next time of now that Tom Dale is not so involved anymore? <laughs> it's a hot one, maybe. Yes, like, I don't think our branding <laughs> changes fast enough, so I'm going to go with yes, he will. <laughs> I mean, maybe we find some marketing people, as Mel suggested, and then, like, everything changes, right? And there's no Tomster at all anymore. Okay, so I've got a really funny story to tell you. Um, I keep up with different parts of the community in the ways that they communicate. And there is a community on Telegram. 
Only this community is not in English. So if I want to understand anything they're saying, I have to like Google Translate a message at a time. So I see a Tomster pop up with no glasses. And then the responses to whatever the message was were like crying, sad face, something or other. I was like, oh no, what's happened? And I translate it. And it's like this Tomster dedicated in memory of Tom Dale, <laughs> who's no longer with us. And I had a heart attack. I was like, wait, Tom, you're just on vacation. I saw your Instagram feed. Like, you're having your best life right now. Like, what happened? So I have to translate. Like, I'm frantically Google translating several more messages to figure out. It's not that he's dead. It's that he's busy. <laughs> <sighs> My God. That was so scary. But I also think Tom Sir looks weird without glasses. So just leave him. It looked very strange, yeah. Also, Tom, if you see this, please maybe tweet something so we know <laughs> you're good. <laughs> um, yeah, and I mean, that concludes the panel. We're slightly over time. Uh, uh, thanks to all the panelists. I think it was wonderful. And I think we do have some announcements, right? I'm not sure whether we have slides for those. Awesome, great. <laughs>